in your Bible this morning, the book of Philippians, chapter number two. See if you can find it, and as soon as you do, stand up, please, Philippians chapter two, and we'll begin reading God's Word in verse number 12, Philippians chapter two, the epistle of joy. Over and over and over in the book of Philippians, Paul talks about rejoicing. And I've preached on joy how many times in the last couple, three months? And so today, uh, the epistle of joy, though that's not our subject, we're certainly going to look at it. Philippians chapter number 2, beginning in verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now note that phrase. Maybe underline it in your Bible when you sit down. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. A wonderful, wonderful passage, and yet an often misinterpreted passage of Scripture. Thank you, and you may be seated. <clears throat> These two verses, as I just mentioned, uh, have caused a lot of consternation to people through the years, God's people, as they read their Bible. And often it, they have misinterpreted them because it has the idea of works and the idea of salvation both in the very same passage. So the question arises, what is the role of works in a person's salvation or in the Christian life? may be better said, the role of works in the Christian life. Does this verse in any way imply that we are to work for our salvation? There are people who teach that, of course, as we do, that salvation is by grace through faith and not of works. That's pretty clear, isn't it? But there are other people who say, well, they quote the book of James, and it says, show me your faith without your works, but I'll show you my faith by my works. Is it possible to be saved and not have any works? And so there's a whole lot of different interpretations of this passage. The context of this passage, this passage was written to people who are already saved. Notice, if you will, it's the book of Philippians, and he's writing to a church at Philippi, and a beautiful little city there in Greece. And Paul wrote to them these, this phrase, but they were already saved. They were Christian people. They were people who were living for the Lord. In fact, this is one of the very few epistles in which Paul doesn't rebuke anybody about false doctrine or their behavior. These are not only Christian people. These are good Christian people for the most part. Very serious Christians, we would say today. So let's dwell on a couple of those words for a few moments. One, I want you to see with me, I want you to notice that phrase, your salvation, in verse number 12. Work out your own salvation, your own salvation. Well, the first thing you notice is salvation is personal, isn't it? It's personal, your own salvation. Salvation is not some impersonal thing that somebody does for you. He talks about your own salvation. And the word salvation, the idea of salvation is deliverance. If I could give you one word that would define salvation in your Bible, make a, make a note of it if you don't know that and you haven't known that before. If I could give you one word that would define salvation, salvation is deliverance. Salvation is to be rescued, to be rescued. Salvation is passive. It's not something that we do. It's something that is done for us. Four or five times the Bible says, salvation is of the Lord. Most people, if you were to go out on the streets and interview people, most people would say something like this. They would tell you that Jesus died for their sins. If you, did, if, you, if you interviewed people here in South Carolina, they would talk about Jesus died for my sins, but you know what they would add? But you have to live it, or you have to do something. 
And you, they would tell you what you, they thought was involved in salvation, and they would add to salvation something. And that's not what the Bible teaches. Remember that verse? Everybody here it, that comes regularly knows it. By grace, that's God's part. God, God gives us unmerited favor. He blesses us even though we don't des- deserve it. By grace, are you saved through faith? That's our part. God's part is grace. Our part is faith. By grace, through faith. And then it goes further and says, and it is not of works, meaning any human effort. There's nothing you can do. Therefore, salvation is God acting upon us, acting in our life. It is not we trying to do something to earn his favor. Here's a good illustration of it, the best one I can find. Up in West Virginia a few years ago, there was a group of men, I think there were eight men, in a coal mine working away, way back there under the bowels of the earth, literally. And part of the mine caved in, the part of the mine between them and the opening of the mine. They are trapped. They're down in the earth, way back a mile deep in the earth, and under the hill there, and they're trapped. All they have is the food that they have in their lunch buckets, and all they have is a battery power for a few hours to help them through their shift, and after that, it will be totally dark. They won't be able to see one thing. After that, they will have no food or no water. They are in a tragic and terrible situation. Well, after a few hours, people on the outside found out they were trapped. And they began to bring together equipment from all over that region, heavy heavy equipment. And they began, they took a bit, and they stood on the top of the mountain, and they looked at the maps of the mines, and they they drilled a, a, a deep well, if you will, a bit, over a mile deep from the top of the hill down to where those miners were to provide them a little opening that would bring in air for them. And later they expanded it, hoping they could drop food and water down through that hole to those men below. And they were doing everything. Hundreds of people were marshaled together. All of them had their lights on their helmets, and they were working around the clock, 24 hours a day for two or three days. And finally, that heavy equipment going through the mine, those backhoes and so on, they began to haul out the dirt that had fallen down from the top of the hill And they were able to push a tunnel all the way through to them. And those men came out four or five days later, I think, before they finally were totally rescued. And now they're fine. They're in good health. They have survived. They have been rescued. Without the action of other people, they would have absolutely zero chance of surviving they would have faced certain death except for the efforts of other people. And there is the analogy. You and I, ladies and gentlemen, are like those miners, trapped in the bondage of sin. Every single one of us, helpless, unable to save ourselves. Hell is not some mystical belief. It is a certain reality if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And Jesus Christ came to the earth, went to the cross, died on the cross. While on the cross, God accepted his death, his suffering, his pain as the payment for all the sins of humanity for all time. That's called the gospel with a big G on the front of it, huh? The gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ came to the earth to rescue sinners. And he did rescue us. He paid the price. And that is salvation. That's exactly what salvation means. Salvation, when I say I am saved, it means I have been rescued. It means I have been delivered from the consequences of my sins through the efforts and the merits of somebody else. I was passive. I merely held out my hands and accepted the gift. It was God. It was Jesus Christ who did all the work that I could be saved for all of eternity. That's the gospel. Boy, it deserves a louder amen than that in a a Baptist church. Isn't it wonderful to be saved today? Are you excited about being saved? Now, tell the truth. 
Are you really truly excited about what God has done in your life? And, and are, are you thrilled by that and blessed by that? I mean, we need to stop and go back to Calvary occasionally, and we just need to remember all that the Lord has done for us, don't we, when he saved us? There are three parts to my salvation today real quickly. I don't want to bog down too long here, but I want you to go back and revisit it and, and enjoy your salvation and be thankful for it. The first thing is Salvation means I have been delivered from sin's penalty. I have been delivered from the penalty of sin, which is hell. Not much preaching on hell today. Not much discussion among Christians. Not many books being written about hell. Nobody wants to think about hell. And yet, the Bible mentions hell frequently. Jesus often referred to hell. And today, I'm afraid we just blotted out. Hell is the penalty for sin. It's not the penalty for awful sinners, murderers, the Charles Mansons and the Adolf Hitlers. Hell is the penalty for anyone whose sin is not paid because a holy, righteous God cannot take sin into his presence. And so he created hell, not for men and women, but for the devil and his angels. But for those who reject and say, I don't want to be rescued. I'll take my own chances. First of all, my friend, you don't have a chance. But if you take your chance and you reject Jesus Christ, if you turn down what he paid for on the cross, then there's the option. That's the penalty for sin. Now, salvation from hell happens in a moment. It's instantaneous. When I repent of my sins, and I receive Jesus Christ by faith, when I truly trust in what he did for me on the cross, then the Bible says that he forgives me of my sins, and he imputes or he puts upon me the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He declares me righteous based on the merits, based on the effort and the work of Christ on the cross. But not only does he forgive me of my sins and come into my life, he does something else. He puts within me a new nature. It's called regeneration. He puts within me eternal life, life that will never cease. And so when I close my eyes in death, I will be more alive in my spirit and my soul than I've ever been in all my existence. I will never die I have eternal life, so promised by the Lord Jesus. So, first of all, salvation is deliverance from sin's penalty. Number two, it is deliverance from sin's power. And the power of sin is bondage. Bondage. That bondage may be mental with thoughts that have taken over and control us beyond our power to even do anything about. That bondage may be physical, as in addictions to drugs or alcohol or other things. And that bondage might be spiritual. It might be belief in a false premise, in a heretical or a heresy, a doctrine that is false, that is unbiblical. It might be involvement in a cult. It might be some sort of aberrant belief that people have it might even go so far as the worship of Satan himself. And there's bondage there too, spiritual bondage. And you know what? You can't escape it. You can't just through your character will to be free and go on and break free. If you could, you could save yourself, but you can't do that. And so you see, you are in bondage if you're outside of Christ. I don't know what the particular form of it may be, but there's many, many things that hold people captive through their minds, through their emotions, bondage. Sin brings bondage. And when we get saved, God gives us the power to break that bondage. We call that sanctification. Big word. I don't like using big words, but sometimes I can't avoid them. Sanctification. And sanctification is the process through which God is working in a Christian's life to make him or her a saint. The word saint comes from the word sanctification. So once I'm saved, past tense, and I've been delivered from hell and the penalty of sin, but that doesn't end my salvation. Salvation is going to be going on throughout my lifetime. 
as God is working in my life to deliver me from the bondage of sin in whatever form it may be, mental, spiritual, physical, or emotional. And God is working in us to give us the power to overcome these bondages and these sins of our flesh. Look back to chapter 1 of Philippians and verse number 6. It's a wonderful verse, and it describes what I'm talking about. It says that being confident of this very thing, that we can have confidence in this, that he which hath begun a good work in you, okay, now that's deliverance from sin's penalty, that's justification. He which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And God is continuing to work in our lives after we're saved. I, want, I don't want you to forget that. See, I think too many people in Baptist churches think of salvation as a moment in time, and they're frozen in that time. I went down to the altar in a revival. I went up in VBS. My mother and dad or some Christian led me to Christ. I went forward in a church service, and I was saved. And they never understand that, hey, that's the beginning of the process. That's not the end. Salvation is a continuing thing with God working in my life, making me like Christ, molding me to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, the motivation for that, so many people, including many of our Baptists, we get all mixed up on that and we become very legalistic. And legalistic, legal means keeping the law, keeping the rules. Let me tell you, you don't get sanctified, you don't grow in grace by keeping rules. That's the wrong motivation. It will discourage you You will give up trying because you can't keep all the rules. Here's the motivation. I want to grow in Christ-likeness not because I'm trying to keep the rules. I am motivated because one day Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to the earth, hung on that cross for me, paid for every one of my sins, loves me with a love that's unconditional and indescribable, and in that love, He loved me before I loved Him, and I want to please Him. That's the motivation for the Christian life. It's not keeping the rules. It is gratitude and love to Jesus for all that He's done in our lives and for us. And then that's not all there is about salvation. Salvation is not only deliverance from sin's penalty, hell. It's not only deliverance from bondage on a daily basis as I live my life. But the third part of salvation is its deliverance to heaven, to something else. And one day our Lord is going to come, and there'll be the rapture. And if it doesn't come in my lifetime, then I will die But either way, man, it's a win-win for the Christian, isn't it? It is a win-win because I'll be taken to heaven. My soul and my spirit will be taken to heaven if I die, My and in the rapture, my body and my soul and my spirit. Now, so it's it's appropriate, it's biblical to say say it like this. I was saved, delivered from the penalty of sin, past tense. I am being saved from the bondage of sin, sanctification, present tense. Right now, God's still working in me and in you, I believe. And thirdly, I shall be saved, future tense, when God takes me to heaven. Salvation in three tenses, past from the penalty of sin, present from the power of sin, future from the presence of sin. Now, after salvation, my second point, I want you to just examine salvation again real thoroughly. You can't affirm your salvation and look at it too many times in life. After salvation, the Christian life is working out what God has already worked in. That's what that verse means. Look at it with me, if you will. Verse 12, last clause. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not telling you to work for your salvation is telling you to work out your salvation. If you understand that, say amen. It's not working for your salvation. Boy, those pronouns, I think they are, they're very, very important. The text doesn't say work for salvation. It says work out your salvation. 
I heard my dear old dad preach on this two or three times in his lifetime. And I remember he used to always say, you can't work out what God hasn't worked in. You can't work out what God hasn't worked in. If you don't have it inside, you can try as hard as you want, but you're not going to be able to work it out. This is for people who are saved people. They are enjoying God's salvation in their life, and we are to work it out. Here's what I mean. <clears throat> Let me illustrate it. When God created the heaven and the earth and the world, he put down deep into the earth gold. He put silver. He put platinum. He put coal and gas and oil, a lot of things. He put it. He worked it in. And then he told us about it in his word, and men began to discover it. And they began to dig down in mines and in oil fields and so on. They began to extract from the earth those things that God had put there. Now, we have to mine it or drill for it and extract it. We then have to refine it and polish it and shape it and melt it and work with the gold and the silver and other processes for other elements that are there. You see what we're doing? We're working out what God worked in. And think of yourself as the earth. We are God's people. He worked within us salvation. And now we're to work it out. There's the motivation. There's the direction for a Christian. That's the role of works in the life of a Christian. We're not working for our salvation. We're working out our salvation for the world to see. I'll give another illustration. I, every Sunday morning, I come to my office, and I get ready, and I put this little gizmo here on the back of my belt. It's a little black box, and... Um, it has a cord running up my back here, and it goes to this microphone. And when I cut it off, and sometimes I forget to turn it on before I walk up here. Those guys tell, tell me back there, they say, just uh, turn it on. You can trust us. <laughs> Tom is always fussing at me because I forget. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, first thing I do when I put this on, I take out the old batteries and I put in the new ones. You know this little gizmo, it lays there all week on the table in my office. It has zero power to do anything. It just lays there. I mean, you could kick it, fuss at it, and it just lays there. It's absolutely inert. And I stick those two little energizers in there, and I put it on, and I walk up here, and he turns me on, and I preach to you, and you hear my voice. My voice goes out on television and live stream and wherever. We capture it on a CD, and it's all because of this little gizmo I have right here. It has no power of its own. Zero power of its own until you get the battery in it and until you use it for its purpose. And boy, what an illustration to me. You see, ladies and gentlemen, even though you've been saved and you have that new, that new nature indwelling you, you have zero power to live a godly, righteous life with all the distractions and temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil. You've got zero power to really live the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. I witnessed to a guy yesterday who was uh, working, on, uh, working over at our house, a cable fellow from the cable company. And I witnessed to him right before he was getting ready to pull out. I said, let me ask you a question. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me talk to you about your spiritual life. Are you living for him? And he said this, I'm doing the best I can. Well, I can tell you how much he's living for the Lord if all he's doing is doing the best he can. Zero. You can't, you can't do it. You can't overcome Satan and the world and the flesh and all the temptations of life. Zero effectiveness. 
Somebody's got to put the battery in. And when the battery's there, you know what's going to happen? You're going to have the power. And you know what the battery is? The battery, the energy, is the Holy Spirit of God working through His Word. And I all the time am challenging you, are you filled with the Spirit? Are you thinking about the Spirit of God in your life? Are you conscious of the Spirit in your life? Are you praying regularly, faithfully, daily to be filled with the Spirit of God? I'm trying to develop this in my life, that before I throw the cover back in the morning and get out of bed, I pray, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. And I go over in my mind what it means to be filled with the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Today, I'm to have love, joy, peace, goodness. I'm to have meekness or humility. I'm to have self-control. Oh, Lord, how I need that one. I'm to have, and I go through those nine fruit of the Spirit. Lord, work that into me because I'm helpless to live for you. My willpower is not powerful enough. My character is not going to see me through. It's not more powerful than Satan. The only way I can make it is somebody puts the batteries in. The Holy Spirit's power in my life. Are you thinking about that today, Christian? Are you living in that reality? Or is it a mechanical thing, just coming to church and listening to the preacher and going home? I tell you, there's power there. Look in chapter 2 and verse 13, and there's a phrase I want you to see. It is God which worketh in you. Now, that worketh in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. That word worketh, you look it up in your, uh, in your languages from which the Bible was translated. I'm going to spell the Greek word for you, and you'll know exactly what it means. E-N-E-R-G-E-O. Ah. What word came to your mind? E-N-E-R-G-E-O. Energy. Power. It is God that worketh in you, that is energizing you. If you're depending on your willpower and your wonderful character, your self-discipline to live a righteous life, you're not going to make it. You need the Holy Spirit's batteries in your life. You need His energy to work in your life, don't you? And I do. Every one of us do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's God that worketh in you. And look what he says back in verse 12. As you have already obeyed. In other words, the Philippians were already doing this. These are good people. These people are already, they're already obeying the Lord and doing all these things. Write this down in your notes for today if you're taking notes. God is always working. And other things are too, it sounds like right now. But God is always working. Do you believe that? I'm reading through my Bible again this year, and yesterday I came to the portion of the day in Numbers, and they, Israel is going through the wilderness, and they're camping out. And they went to this certain place in their 40-year journey through the wilderness, and they camped out, and they stayed in that place for over a year. And, and the Lord spoke to me, as a, uh, not audibly, but I mean an impression in my heart, my mind, is these people stayed here for over a year. From all outward appearances, God wasn't doing anything. They're just camped out there in the middle of the wilderness. wilderness. Don't you know that a lot of those men and women were looking at each other and saying, when is Moses going to move? What are we sitting out here for? We're making no progress at all. And then you begin to read the background story, and you know what? God was working. Now, you write it down. You don't ever forget it. God is working, and He's working right now in your life. He's working around you through people and circumstances and events and and His Word and His Holy Spirit. God is working. Now, let me tell you, and 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 I won't be kind when I say this, most of us aren't listening. 
Most of us are not listening. There's too much noise in our life. And we couldn't, we, we don't hear him until he comes up and hits us with the proverbial two before over the head. God is working. He's working around you right now, and he's working in my life. He's working in every, every one of his children. God is always with us. He's not forsaken us. But you see, I got a DVD, and I got a CD player, and I got a TV, and I've got a phone, and I've got a computer. And all the time today, we're just so wired. We're wired to just about everything but the voice of God, aren't we? A little challenge for you. One day, just try to spend as much time with God and His Word and prayer as you do texting and on your phone. Just one day. And begin to listen, to get quiet inside. Be still and know that I'm God. And we just block him out with all the noise of our lives, the hectic pace of modern life. God is working, I promise you. One of the most often repeated, Repeated questions people will ask me is, Pastor, what is God's will for me? You don't need to raise your hand, but how many of you ever wonder, what is God's will for me? Come back tonight, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to spend about 30 or 35 minutes in detail going through how you can know God's will. But notice what I said. I didn't say how you can know God's will for you. I said how you can know God's will big difference. What is God's will for me? Wrong question. Old bit of wisdom. Listen to it. Ask the wrong question, and you will get the wrong answer. How often? Every time. Ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answer every single time without exception. What's the wrong question? What is God's will for me? Here's the right question. What is God's will? What is God's will? You see, one puts the emphasis on me, God doing something for me. Let's turn around and make it right. What is God's will? Find out what God's doing and join Him, said experiencing God, right? Find out what He's doing and you know what? Your will will emerge out of that. You'll figure that out real, real quick. Now, in the rest of this chapter, in the rest of this book, really, the Apostle Paul shows us the example of the Lord Jesus Christ here. And he says, now, make sure your salvation. Understand that once you're saved, the rest of your Christian life is God working out in your life the salvation that he's put into you through grace. Now, lastly, he said, I'm going to give you an example. And the example is Jesus Christ himself. Now, take your Bible and look with me and follow me because I have to go real quick. Verse 5, we are to think like Christ thinks. Let this, let this mind way of thinking be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. We are to think, if you want to write these down, I'll give you four or five things real quick that Christ showed us in doing God's will. Number one, think like Christ thinks. I was reading about the flying Walden Walendas. They were the greatest group of tight wire walkers in all the world. And the patriarch, the old father of the whole group was Carl Walenda. He strung a wire, a high wire, 121 feet high between two towers of, two, of a hotel down in Puerto Rico, 1978, got up on it and was walking it and fell off and died, 121 foot fall. But he had, he had, he had, he had walked the wires for uh, decades and never had a serious accident. The world's greatest tight wire walker. Well, his wife, after he died, made this observation. She said, something happened with Carl that had never happened before. 
Up until then, Carl focused on walking. And then she said, before he died, as he was practicing for that last act, he put all of his energy into not falling rather than walking. See, his thinking changed. Lots of Christians are always going around thinking about not falling instead of walking, aren't we? Walk, and the walk begins with thinking like Jesus thought. Verse 7, we're to serve like Christ served. Jesus is the model for us in service. Man, you people that have been serving in that choir, we're to serve like Jesus served. Jesus was always the servant all through the Bible. In fact, in Isaiah, God calls him my servant, my servant, over and over. Are you serving to the capacity that the Lord wants you to? I recently read Bill Bright's book about his last year of life. It was so touching to me because Bill Bright said, one day my wife and I decided on something in our life. We said, from now on, we will be slaves of Jesus Christ. He took it from the word, the bondservant of Christ, that Paul said. Vonette and I decided we will be slaves of Jesus Christ. If anybody ever showed that, Bill, Bill Bright did. In fact, if you visited the cemetery where he's buried today in Orlando, Florida, there's a tombstone that has on it these words, Bill and Vonette Von Bright, slaves of Jesus Christ. Wow, I could think of no higher epitaph than anybody could ever write about me or you or anyone else. He or she was a slave, a love slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing Paul says, if you want to walk in God's will, is to be humble there in verse number 8. It says that Jesus humbled himself. Boy, how he did such condescension to come from heaven down to the earth. And we all need humility. If we be honest, there's not a single one of us in this building that are not touched by pride. Verse 8, it says he was obedient. In, in fact, he was obedient even to death. The most awful thing we can imagine is death. And yet Jesus Christ obeyed the Father even to the point of going to the cross and dying. Then go down to verse 14, do all things without murmuring and disputing. Ah, there's God's will. Are you, do you ever grumble? Grumbling is, or murmuring is grumbling. Disputing means arguing. Are you ever argumentative? Well, Jesus was not. He is our example in God's living out God's will. And then in verse 15, we're to shine as lights in a dark world. Well, you put any little tiny light in a dark place, and it's easily seen. And we're to show that kind of integrity in our lives. That is, the darkness gathers around us in the world, and we know it's gathering. That we're that candle. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That's what God's will is for you and for me. And then in verses 16 through 18, now watch here. Take your Bible, get your pen if you will. Verse number 16, holding forth the word of life that I may say it, rejoice in the day of Christ. There's the joy that I've not run and lived my life in vain or labored in vain. Yea, and I, if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I, what's the word? Joy and rejoice with you all. And verse 18, for the same cause also, do you joy and rejoice? Five times in two verses, he talks about joy and rejoicing. It is God's will that you and I be filled with joy. That's part of the Christian life. I've been telling you that. It's the part of the Christian life that attracts other people to Christ, is our joy. Now, Paul, when he wrote this, was in his final days. He was locked up in prison. When Paul, the apostle Paul wrote this, he knew he was at the end, and yet he refused to focus on the dark side of things. Even the possibility of his immediate death didn't rob him of his joy. 
You say, Pastor, what you've just gone through here, that's good, but it's an impossible standard. No, it isn't. Let me tell you why. Number one, you've got God's Word. Number two, you're indwelled by God's Spirit. Number three, you're in a wonderful church. And number four, in Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God never asks you to do one thing that He will not empower you to do if you're willing to obey Him. Bow your head with me, if you will, please.